which is the great commandment in the law. For them, for the Jews, it was a Sabbath. And they, if Jesus didn't say that, they would try to question him. So Jesus said, the great commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That's something like saying, I want you to be healthy from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Something like that. If we, if we heard that about our physical life, oh, that guy loves me so much. He wants me to be healthy from the crown of my head to the sole of my foot. Every part of me to be healthy. Heart, liver, kidneys, everything to be healthy. That's what it means. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And Jesus said, like a coin has got two sides. And if the other side of a coin is blank, it's a fake. A currency note has got two sides. One side is blank. It's a fake. And a man who says, I love God with all my heart. That side is right. When the other side is blank, fake. There is another side. Jesus said, and I can't leave it without telling you the other side. Verse 39, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what proves that currency note is genuine. That's what proves your understanding of God's commandment is correct. Both sides are there. And you can't have one without the other. He said, the, the second is like it. Verse 39, it's exactly like it. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. The law is an expression for the five books of Moses, first five books. And the prophets is referring to the rest of the Old Testament. 34 books. Some of it is history and some of it is prophecies. But the expression, the law and the prophets, is what we today would call the Old Testament. In those days, it was the full Bible. And he says, the whole Bible hangs on two commandments. If you obey those two, you've, you've kept it. The whole Bible. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that is an expression of God's love for us. When God teaches me to love my neighbor as myself, it's an expression of God's tremendous love for me that I don't get a cancer inside me. That the laws we, you know, when they uh, tell people don't eat junk food, be careful about the food you eat. We are so careful of the food we give to our children. This is exactly like that. God wants us to be healthy spiritually, to keep his commandments. So when, God, when Moses said that to the Israelites, he had already given them what we know as the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know whether all of you know the Ten Commandments, but I thought I would go through them with you today so that we get educated. The Ten Commandments are listed in Exodus chapter 20. That's the first thing all of you should know. Your children should know Exodus chapter 20. It's a round figure, 20, Ten Commandments. And the first commandment is, verse 2 and 3, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods but me. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of sin. For us, it is like that. Out of slavery to the devil. Verse 2. I'm interpreting this in terms of the New Testament. You shall have no other gods but me. That's the number one commandment. How is it in the New Covenant? It's exactly what Jesus said. Luke 14. If you, you come back to Exodus 20. Luke 14. Jesus is telling us how to be his disciple. Number one commandment, you shall love me more than everybody else. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. There's no place, no competition for that love. Luke 14, 26, from father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, or your own life. That is the first commandment that the Lord Jesus must be absolutely supreme in my life, where the voice of my father, the voice of my mother does not influence me. The voice of my wife does not influence me. The voice of my husband will not influence me. The voice of my children, brothers, sisters, and not even the voices I hear within me will not influence me. I'm going to put Jesus first in every area of my life. I will not listen to any other voice. You know, there are many times we hear other voices. Sometimes those voices are from outside where loved ones will say to us, go on, be reasonable. Don't be so extreme. I've heard that said to me. Many people will say that. Yeah, you're too radical, too extreme. You can't live like that in this world. Just be sensible. Yeah, yeah. I see what happens to Christians who live by those principles. And I've seen what happens to Christians who live by saying, I will not listen to those voices. I shall love the Lord with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And no one will take the place that Christ has in my life. Nobody. Not even my father. However much he may have sacrificed for me, mother, brothers, sisters, wife, and children. And I wonder whether all of you sitting here can go through verse 26, step by step by step by step and say, Lord, 
none of these people will influence me. I will not love my children so much that I will consider their earthly comfort above their being disciples of Christ. No, I shall not do that. That is loving your children more than you love Christ. I will not do that. There's so many ways in which uh, in schools and all children are taught to compromise. Many children cheat in their examinations, give false statements when they want to get admission to a college or something like that. What all wrong goes on, even among Christians? No, God's blessing cannot be there if you got into some situation by telling a lie. Impossible. If you think that a lie will open a door for me into a particular job, which Almighty God cannot, but the lie is more almighty than God, how do you expect God to bless you in that job? Did any of you get into a college by telling a lie? I hope not. I don't know what your future will be. No, you can't go back on it, but I don't know. Somewhere along the path, you took a wrong path and your parents didn't protect you from that. I don't know whether you got a job by telling a lie. I don't know whether you got a visa to come here by telling a lie. I don't know. What would have been the future if you had told the truth? Have you missed God's will somewhere? Was it God's will that at some point in your life you should have told a lie in order to get something? Because a lie was more almighty than God? Well, you can't do anything about it now. There are many things we've done in the past we can't do anything about. What shall we do? Live in regret for the rest of our No. God forgives us, but certain things, even Almighty God cannot set right. I remember in one of our churches in India, a man came, was unconverted. He had AIDS, but then he got converted and he came to our church and we, he, he was really born again. But he never got cured of AIDS. Very soon he died, but he went to heaven. He was forgiven, but he died. He, there is forgiveness. There is also the reaping of what we have sown. Both go together. You can, I mean, going to heaven is not everything. I'll tell you this, and that's another thing which I want to convince everybody about. It's an absolute lie that if you go to heaven, <laughs> everything is solved. Then it doesn't matter, you know, how we really lived on the earth. That guy was wholehearted and sacrificed and gave his life for the Lord and went and died as a missionary. And I lived a sort of a comfortable life and sailed my way into heaven. We're all going to be equal in eternity. Absolutely false. And you say, what's going to be the difference in eternity? I'll tell you. In three words, I have the answers to many of these questions. I don't know. But I do know there will be a difference. Because Jesus said so, so many times, my reward is with me to give to every man according to what he has done and lived. Is that a lie? Heaven and earth will pass away. That word will not be passed away. Will not pass away. That's why I do not believe that everybody will be equal in heaven. I do not believe that some that no believer will have any regret in heaven. That every believer is going to live in heaven without regret. I don't believe it one bit because if it were true, I'd have to say Jesus is a liar. It's like when some non-Christians come to me and say, why do you say Jesus Christ is the only way? I ask them this question. I say, do you believe, do you respect Jesus Christ at least? Forget about me. Do you respect Jesus Christ? Says, oh, yes. I say, let me read to you what Jesus himself said. John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now tell me. You said you respect Jesus Christ. Is he speaking the truth or not? You say he's a liar, that you say that you can come to the Father some other way. I say no. I say that because I respect Jesus Christ as one who speaks the truth. The same Jesus Christ says, I will give to every man according as his work shall be. So how in the world can everybody be equal in heaven? Jesus has got to be an outright liar if it's going to be like that. Now, I'm not saying we work for reward. Anyone who works for reward will probably get zero in heaven. No, we don't work for reward. I always say, Lord, you've already rewarded me more than enough by dying on the cross for me. I'm not expecting anything more than that. I don't work for reward. No, I don't do a single thing for reward. I don't make any sacrifice in my life for a reward. No. I sacrifice and do things and I will do, keep on doing. Even if I live to 100 years old, I will live 100% sacrificially for the Lord because he already did so much for me. It's like a person who's given me billions of dollars to meet my need and much more than my need. And then, you think I'm going to go and ask him for more? Do you think I'll, if I do a little service for him, I'll go to him and say, now, can you give me $100 for that work I did? Impossible. He's already gifted me billions of dollars. How will I go and ask him for $100 for the work I did for him? That's how I look at it. I cannot think of looking at Jesus in eternity and saying, where's my reward? I hope you're not. 
He's already done so much for you. Everything we do is an expression of gratitude to the Lord. I put it like this. I say my whole life is writing a note saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. And when I'm finished saying that, I'll die. And I think I've come up to T-H-A and I haven't come. I still got a long way to write something. The rest of the sentence. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's why he saved us from accidents. Because we haven't finished the sentence. I hope you look at your whole life as writing one sentence. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, <clears throat> don't let anyone come take the place of the Lord in your life. That's the first commandment. Nobody. Not your job. Not your father, mother. And the second commandment is, in, uh, back to Exodus 20, you shall not, uh, verse 4, you shall not make any idol or anything like that or worship that and serve that. Verse 5, Exodus 20, verse 5. Because I'm a jealous God. Because if you do that, your iniquity will go down on your children and on a third and fourth generation. How does that apply to us? We don't worship physical idols. You know, some Christians in some denominations have what they call icons. Icons are pictures of saints. Why do you have, it's a form of an idol. You call it an icon or an idol or call it whatever you like. You have a picture of someone you worship. The point is not a picture. You can keep a picture of a loved one, but you're not worshiping it. But if you keep a picture of some saint that doesn't even look like that and you worship it, or pass that person to pray for you, that's a lot of garbage. Nobody can pray for you, not even Mary. It's only Jesus Christ is the only one who's the intercessor for us. So an idol is not just these physical things. We don't have that. But anything that takes the place of God in our life, like the main thing Jesus said was money. He said in Luke 16, 13, you cannot love God and money. It's like telling a, a woman, you can't marry both these men. You have to choose. But you say he's so nice and he's also so nice. That's fine. But you still got to choose one of them. What would you think of a woman who says, I like both. They're so good. Both of them are so good. You think there's something wrong with a Christian sister who wants to marry two men. You wouldn't think that such a sister is spiritual. What do you think of a Christian who wants to love Jesus and love money? There's absolutely no difference between that Christian and a woman who wants to marry two men. But a Christian a woman <clears throat> can marry a man and have a male servant who works. I mean, if she was an official in an office, she has a secretary or someone who could be a male secretary serving her. That's fine. Or a servant like a driver of the car or something like that. You can have that, but you can't be a husband. That's the point. So you can have other things as your servants. <clears throat> Many luxuries, comforts, a house, money. But not as a husband, not as one you love, not as one you're devoted to, not as one you live for. <clears throat> what do you think of a woman who lives for a car driver or a secretary in the office? It's crazy. But that's exactly how it is when a man says, I love Jesus Christ. And most of the time he's living for money, 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 money. And if he loses a little bit of money, he gets so worried about it. We need to know the difference between having money and loving money. To have money, money is a gift of God. Let me tell you that. It's not the devil who invented money. All the gold in the world was not placed there by the devil. The devil did not create one gram of gold. God created all the tons of gold there are in the world. He created all the diamonds and the pearls and every single thing. But like the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God says, don't get attached to it. Make that serve you. If you have a driver in the car, don't get attached to him. Let him serve you. So, Money is a very good servant, but a terrible master. It's like fire. Fire is a wonderful servant. Look how we cook food with it. But it's a terrible master. If you let your house catch fire, it's, it'll destroy it. Money is like that. Keep it under control. Know when to turn off the stove before the house catches fire. Keep that fire under control. Use it. Use it every day. Money. Have many pots burning on your stoves. That's fine. Many fires lit, but don't let the fire take over the house. God is not against our having good things. We read in Luke, uh, sorry, 1 Timothy 6. Sometimes Christians give the impression that God doesn't want us to enjoy anything. He wants us to be so disciplined. We must not enjoy an ice cream. We must not enjoy a chocolate. We must not enjoy. It's always very difficult things. Let me surprise you by something God's word says. 1 Timothy 6, 17. 
This is especially rich in, written to the rich. The poor cannot afford many things in the world, but rich people can afford many things. What should they do? Instruct those who are rich in the world, 1 Timothy 6, 17, not to be conceited. It's a tremendous temptation for rich people to become proud, to look down on poor people, to look down on others who don't have, it could be rich in education, to look down on those who are not so educated, not to be conceited and not to fix their hope on uncertainty of riches. It's very uncertain. I tell you, it's more uncertain than the stock market. You think if the stock market goes down one day, you know it's going to go up one other day. Riches are not like that. It's absolutely uncertain. But fix your hope on God who gives you all this money richly. <laughs> does God give money richly? Yes, he certainly does to some people. And why does he give it to them? He gives us things to enjoy. Have you read that word? Have you read that God gives you material things to enjoy? Yeah, I, I enjoy many material things. You have a comfortable house, enjoy it. You can afford good food, enjoy it. You can afford a car or two cars, enjoy it. And don't feel guilty about it. God has given us richly all things to be enjoyed. Don't get conceited. Don't depend on it. Don't make it an idol. Keep it in its proper place like a servant. Not, not, not your husband. Christ alone is our husband. That is a servant. And I'm always going to keep money as my servant. That's how I've tried to live. I'm not preaching what I don't practice. And it has made my life extremely happy. I'll tell you that. I will never allow money to sit on my head. However much God gives me, I'm going to keep it under my feet. And I'm going to enjoy it. I don't feel guilty about enjoying what God gives me. But it also says, verse 18, be good and be generous to those who are in need. That's also a privilege God gives us when he gives us money. That way, we have an eternal treasure in heaven. So that's the second commandment. Don't make worship any idol. Um, and then it goes on to say in the third commandment is, you shall not take the name, verse 7, Exodus 20, verse 7. No, let me, before I go there, it says here, if you worship this idol, the iniquity will fall even upon your children. Exodus 20, verse 5. Do you know that if you worship money, you can destroy your children? Yes. There are umpteen examples of, in, in the world around us of rich people's children who have not been brought up to be grateful to God for every gift. Teach your children to be grateful to God for the house they live in, for the car they have, for an education they can get. Teach them to be grateful to God and not to worship those things. Otherwise, the iniquity will go to their children and they'll grow up wayward and wild. Yeah, and I've seen umpteen examples of that in the world around. And then the next thing is, don't take the name of the Lord your God, verse 7, in vain. We have to be very respectful to the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I'll tell you, you know, Jesus taught us to pray. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus because he's the one mediator between us and our Father. I cannot go to the Father directly. There's one mediator God has put between me and him. Otherwise, I cannot go. I have to know, come in the name of Jesus, clothed in his righteousness. Otherwise, God is too holy. God is so holy that even the angels... Hide their faces, we read in Isaiah 6. Holy angels, cover their faces. Where are we? Isaiah saw that and he said, oh, what a sinner I am. And uh, so we can only come in the, in the name of Jesus to the Father. And even when you sometimes we pray, Lord Jesus, that's all right. Praying to the Lord Jesus is all right. We are actually coming to him saying, actually, Lord, take my petition to the Father. It's perfectly okay, whichever way you pray. There's no rules on this matter of prayer. But we essentially pray to our Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. But we should not... Take the name of the Lord in vain. You know, when people get into a situation and say, oh my God. What do you mean? And some people change it to, oh my gosh. And some people just change it to OMG. And uh, some people say, oh gee. Oh gee what? What does G stand for? It's all various ways in which, what are they saying? I, I haven't understood what is the meaning behind it. Are you saying, why did God allow this? I, I assume that's what they're saying. Why in the world, oh God, did you allow this? Oh my God, why in the world did you allow this to happen? Or did you allow this to happen there? My brothers and sisters, you may think this is all extreme. I learned one thing in my life. If I respect the commands of God and honor him, the word of the Lord is, I will honor those who honor me. 